Hello and welcome to this news live from Istanbul. I'm Jawad Dayani and these are the headlines. In Pakistan, a top-level army huddle says India's attempts to perpetuate terrorism and sabotage the CPAC are a threat to peace and security in the region. Presided over by Army Chief General Kamar Javed Bajwa, the forum pledged to protect the country against any Indian misadventure. In the meeting reviewed the national security in the wake of increased ceasefire violations by Indian troops along the line of control. The United Nations and the European Union have called for an immediate and unconditional ceasefire in Afghanistan. At the 2020 Afghanistan conference in Geneva, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said ceasefire will create a conducive environment for Doha peace talks with the Taliban. EU foreign policy chief said a restoration of an Islamic government will affect bloc support to Afghanistan. Donald Trump has accepted a formal U.S. transition to President-elect Joe Biden. The president says the federal agency overseeing the handover must do what needs to be done to initial protocols. The U.S. General Services Administration says it acknowledges Biden as the apparent winner of the election. It came as Biden's victory in the state of Michigan was officially certified. The global number of coronavirus infections has crossed 59 million with over 1.39 million deaths. The U.S. has recorded over 142,000 new cases and 921 fatalities in a day, taking its death tally to over 257,000. In India, the virus has claimed over 134,000 lives and infected more than 9.17 million people. Pakistan has recorded nearly 3,000 new cases and 48 deaths overnight, raising the toll to over 7,700. And in football, Wolverhampton Wanderers have drawn their home fixture one all against Southampton. Theo Walcott's 58th minute goal was equalized by Wolves' Pedro Neto 17 minutes later. Southampton are fifth in the Premier League table, while Wolves moved up three places to the ninth spot. Those were the headlines and detailed stories right after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back and now for the news in detail. In Pakistan, a top-level army huddle says India's attempts to perpetuate terrorism and sabotage the CPAC project are a threat to peace and security in the region. Presided over by Army Chief General Kamar Javed Bajwa, the forum pledged to protect the country against any Indian misadventure. The meeting reviewed the national security in the wake of increased ceasefire violations by Indian troops along the line of control. It also discussed recent developments in the Afghan peace process. The army chief also vowed to support the government's efforts to tackle a second wave of coronavirus. Pakistan has rejected Indian attempts to implicate the country in an alleged attack in occupied Kashmir last week. The Foreign Office said India's briefing to a group of foreign envoys on the attack reflects its desperation to build anti-Pakistan narrative. It said India wants to divert world's attention from its state terrorism in occupied Kashmir and Pakistan. Last week, Pakistan unveiled a dossier containing undeniable evidence of India's sponsorship of terrorism in the country. Pakistan has once again warned the international community against Indian attempts to stage a false flag operation to wrongfully implicate Pakistan and disrupt peace in the region. The United Nations and the European Union have called for immediate unconditional ceasefire in Afghanistan. 
At the 2020 Afghanistan Conference in Geneva, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said ceasefire will create a conducive environment for Doha peace talks with the Taliban. EU foreign policy chief said the ceasefire should accompany the ongoing peace process. However, Joseph Burrell said restoration of an Islamic government will affect the bloc's support to Afghanistan. The EU has announced maintaining its support of 1.2 billion euros for the country over the next four years, but it expects Kabul's commitment to democracy and accountability. Meanwhile, Britain has pledged $227 million in annual civilian and food aid for the war-torn country. The amount pledged by the UK is slightly greater than it promised in the last conference in Brussels. The Saudi-led coalition in Yemen says it has destroyed five mines led by the Houthi group in the Red Sea. Saudi State TV said mines are of Iranian-made Sada prototype. The coalition said the ongoing Houthi hostilities threaten the regional maritime security. It comes a day after Houthi rebels attacked the Saudi Petroleum Products Distribution Plant in Jeddah. State media said the terrorist attack caused a fire in a fuel tank at the plant's terminal. It said the fire was extinguished and no casualties have been reported from the site of the accident. The media added Saudi Aramco's fuel supplies have not been affected as the result of the attack. The Saudi Energy Ministry said the repeated terrorist attacks do not only target the kingdom's security, but also threatens the stability of the Gulf region. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says he will visit the kingdom of Bahrain in the near future. Netanyahu said Gulf states Crown Prince Salman Hamad bin Al Khalifa invited him to visit Manama over a recently held telephone call. He said they had a friendly conversation focused on strengthening ties between the two countries. Earlier, Israel sent its first official delegation to Sudan after the North African country established diplomatic ties with Tel Aviv last month. The UN special mission in Libya has called for a probe into allegations of attempts to sabotage the peace talks. Virtually speaking, at the second round of the talks, UN special mission in Libya's acting head, Stephanie Williams, said those found guilty of provocations against the dialogue participants will face sanctions. Williams said the mission does not tolerate the use of hate speech and incitement of violence. The second round was convened to discuss available options to select an executive authority to lead the pre-election stage in Libya. This came after the first round of talks held last week in Tunisia failed to name the executive authority. The next meeting of the second round is scheduled for tomorrow. The UN has offered its assistance to Russia to assess the volume of humanitarian aid needed in Nagorno-Karabakh. Moscow brokered peace between Azerbaijan and Armenia and called for the UN humanitarian help in the war-affected region. UN Secretary General Spokesperson Stefan Dujaric said the Humanitarian Affairs Office and relevant UN entities are ready to collaborate on one's conditions on the ground permit. Dijeric said he hopes the ceasefire will enable aid workers to have access to all people in need. He added UN Sec Secretary General Antonio Guterres has stressed on Yerevan and Baku to show readiness for humanitarian assistance. Russia says its warship has caught a U.S. Navy destroyer operating illegally in its territorial waters. In a statement, Russia's defense ministry said its warship chased the U.S. destroyer of near the Sea of Japan. It said the U.S. ship returned to neutral waters after being warned by the Russian destroyer, Admiral Vinogradov. It added the foreign vessel was warned through an international communications channel. Authorities said the U.S. ship crossed the borders of Russian territory at least two kilometers. Washington has not yet made any comment on the situation. China has lashed out at the U.S. over its withdrawal from the Open Skies Treaty. In a statement, Foreign Ministry spokesperson Zhao Lijian said the move undermined military trust and transparency. The ministry spokesperson added that U.S. withdrawal will risk future attempts at arms control. The treaty to which China is not a signatory had allowed each country overflight rights to inspect military facilities. Earlier, the U.S. announced its decision of withdrawing from the treaty after accusing Russia of non-compliance with the pact. 
In a tweet, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said the move has made America more secure. Tigray conflict has reached a watershed moment as the deadline given by the federal government to Tigray Liberation Front approaches. In the latest development, Tigrayan forces claim to have completely destroyed the Ethiopian Army's 21st Mechanized Division. Meanwhile, the Ethiopian government says its forces have encircled the front's last hideout in Makele. However, the government has not yet commented on the Tigrayan forces' claim of destroying the army's division. Earlier, Ethiopian authorities announced to indict charges of terrorism and high treason on Tigrayan leadership. Addis Ababa says it offered a 72-hour ultimatum to give Tigrayan people a chance to understand the reality. Donald Trump has accepted a formal U.S. transition to President-elect Joe Biden. The president says the federal agency overseeing the handover must do what needs to be done to initial protocols. In a tweet, the United States president asked his team to do the same. Trump, however, did not formally concede the election to Biden. Earlier, the United States General Services Administration ascertained that Biden is the apparent winner of the election. GSA's green signal came shortly after Michigan certified Biden's win in the battleground state. The Biden team will now have access to federal funds and an official office to conduct his transition over the next two months. The team has welcomed the start of the transition process, saying it was a needed step to begin tackling the challenges. Earlier, Biden unveiled a foreign policy and national security team consisting of old colleagues from the Obama administration. Biden picked Anthony Blinken to be his secretary of state and Jake Sullivan as the security advisor. His transition team said Alejandro Mayorkas will be nominated for Homeland Security Secretary and Linda Thompson-Greenfield for United Nations Ambassador. President-elect also chose former Senator John Kerry to be a special presidential envoy for climate. Joe Biden will be sworn in as the 46th United States president on the 20th of January, 2021. European Council President Charles Michel has invited U.S. President-elect Joe Biden to rebuild the transatlantic alliance. In a phone call, Michel invited Biden to a special meeting in 2021 with the EU heads in the bloc hub Brussels. In a statement, the Council's president proposed to remake a strong alliance based on common interests and shared values. It also highlighted Biden's support for preserving peace and stability on the sensitive Irish border despite Britain leaving the EU. Earlier during the campaign, Biden warned London to protect peace on Ireland or else there will be no U.S. trade deal for Britain. China has urged Britain to curb its colonial mindset, hypocrisy and double standards. The Chinese Foreign Ministry was responding to the UK series of six monthly reports on Hong Kong. The Hong Kong's government says it strongly objects to groundless accusations made by Britain. In a statement, the government spokesman said Hong Kong is an inalienable part of the People's Republic of China. He said London should respect international protocol and refrain from interfering with the internal affairs of another country. Earlier, the UK released a report criticizing Hong Kong's new national security law. Global number of coronavirus infections has crossed 59 million with over 1.39 million deaths. The U.S. has recorded over 142,000 new cases and 921 fatalities in a day, taking its death tally to over 257,000. What on the coronavirus in this report? COVID-19 continues to soar as the pharmaceuticals grapple to find the vaccine with maximum efficiency. A toxic mix of holiday season coupled with skyrocketing cases is said to worsen the already grim situation in the U.S., even the country's largest biocontainment training center in Nebraska has run out of space. The morgues in New York City have maxed out, forcing the city administration to store the bodies in refrigerated trucks. Those um, who we lost, uh, their families are still trying to determine the best way to provide services for them and uh, just have been struggling because of the pandemic and other challenges. So we're, we're trying to work with each and every family of those we lost who are in that situation to make sure that they uh, can have the kind of uh, services they want to have at the right time. Europe continues to struggle with unprecedented spike in cases in almost every country of the region. 
Spain's King Philippi V started a 10-day quarantine after contacting a COVID-positive person. Meanwhile, Germany is set to extend the lockdown to another three weeks to make the family gatherings over Christmas possible. The UK has also set out new measures to replace a blanket lockdown with targeted restrictions in the last push before the vaccine comes out. However, Prime Minister Boris Johnson has denounced the idea of mandatory vaccination in the country. Let's be clear, there will be no compulsory vaccination. Uh, that's not the way we do things in this country. We think it's a good idea. Uh, and, you know, I totally reject the, the propaganda of the, of the anti-vaxxers. They're, they're wrong. Uh, you know, vulnerable people, uh, people who need a vaccine should definitely uh, get a vaccine and everybody should get a vaccine as soon as it is uh, available, uh, according to the advice of the, the JCVI. Meanwhile, India has registered over 4,800 cases and 480 deaths from the virus overnight as the country's death daily crosses 134,000 mark. In Pakistan, 48 people have lost their lives to COVID-19 over the past 24 hours. The health ministry says with new deaths, the toll has risen to 7,744. The ministry said nearly 3,000 people tested positive for the disease overnight which brings the country's number of active cases to more than 40,000. It added out of over 379,000 countrywide cases, more than 331,000 have recovered so far. The ministry said the Sindh province has reported the highest over 164,000 cases. Punjab is second with over 115,000 infections. More stories to follow right after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. China says it supports the greater role of Pakistan's Gawadar port in the regional cooperation on trade and goods. Gawadar is an important component of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor flagship project. In a news briefing, Foreign Ministry's spokesperson Zali Jian said he is glad to see the start of international transit activities there. He said the CPAC is not only delivering benefits to China and Pakistan, but also facilitating the regional connectivity. The transit activities have started with the arrival of the first fish cargo at the Gawada port for onward shipment to China. More vessels containing international cargo for transit to Afghanistan are scheduled to arrive there in the coming days. Earlier, Islamabad and Beijing vowed to jointly defend the project against all the subversive activities. China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi is set to embark on his visit to Japan amid ongoing regional tensions. The top diplomat's visit comes as the first high-level trip after Tokyo's leadership transition in September. During his visit, Wang is expected to meet with Prime Minister Yu Shehide Suga, who has sought balanced ties with China. Talking to reporters, Japanese foreign ministers said there are various pending issues between the two countries. Toshimitsu Motegi said it was important to reach solutions through such high-level meetings. Chinese foreign minister will depart for South Korea after Japan for talks that will include North Korea. President Xi Jinping pledges to enhance China-Ethiopia bilateral relations as well as the Belt and Road cooperation. He made this a remark on the 50th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic ties between the two countries. President Xi Jinping says the friendship of the two countries has been getting stronger since it was established over half a century ago. He says both the countries have helped each other to fight the COVID-19 pandemic in an exemplary manner. Xi Jinping said he is ready to work with President Zewede in building a closer China-Africa community with a shared future. President Zewede says she is looking forward to strengthening and expanding bilateral cooperation with China. In Colombia, seven people have been killed after a landslide struck a dance club in Antioquia state. The Disaster Management Authority of Antioquia says nine others injured have been taken to the hospital. The governor of Antioquia has urged locals to stay away from the disaster site. The country is reeling from the torrential rains that caused flash floods as well. Landslides are common in the mountainous country, especially during the rainy season. 
in Chile clashes erupted on the streets of the capital as the anti-government protesters faced off with the right police. The demonstration was carried out against President Sebastian Piñera's bid to halt an opposition-sponsored pension bill. The bill would allow the citizens to draw down a second installment from privately held pensions. The police used water cannons and tear gas to disperse the angry demonstrators. Earlier, Chilean president said his government would appeal to the constitutional court to halt the legislation. Advocates of the legislation say they would help Chileans to deal with the economic fallout from the coronavirus. Officials and well-wishers gathered at Islamabad Zoo for a farewell party for Pakistan's lonely elephant, Kawan. He will set off for a new life in Cambodia this week. More in this report. After years of campaigning by animal rights advocates and pop star sure to rescue Kawan, he is finally to be airlifted to an elephant sanctuary. To mark the occasion, officials from all walks of life gathered among balloons and signs saying, Farewell Kavan, we will miss you. This started in Pakistan and went worldwide. We also want to thank the Pakistani lawyers that helped get a historic landmark judgment giving the elephants the rights to freedom. And that is, that is truly an incredible thing. Children posed for photos and musicians performed in front of the enclosure, with Kavan at one point serenaded while he snacked on some grass. <laughs> Four-paw spokesman Marion Lombard says it is never easy to move a wild animal weighing 4.8 tons, but Kavan is responding well to training. Lombard organized an event for the people and the government of Pakistan to say goodbye to Kavan. Our children used to visit it and they enjoyed its company. It was the life of the Islamabad Zoo, it was life of Islamabad and we're all going to miss him so much and we're so sad that we didn't really fulfill our part of the responsibility to him and we couldn't take care of him that well. Kawan has been trained for weeks with international specialists to get him used to the small enclosure and loud noises expected on the 10-hour flight to Cambodia. Sher is due to arrive in Islamabad later in the week to finally meet and see off the elephant she had worked for years to rescue. Stocks in most major Asia-Pacific markets are trading higher over hopes of a COVID-19 vaccine. In Japan, the Nikkei 225 jumped more than 2.5%, while the Topics index advanced over 2%. South Korea's Kospi, too, has moved up half percent. Hong Kong's Hang Seng has edged above the flat line, while the shares in Australia have gained over 1.5%. But mainland Chinese stocks have dipped under the flat line. Auto giant General Motors is set to recall a 7 million vehicles worldwide with Takata airbag inflators. Detroit automakers' move comes after a U.S. safety agency declined its petition to avoid the call. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has asked GM to recall 5.9 million 2007 to 2014 model trucks and SUVs. According to the authority, the inflators risked explosion after long-term exposure to heat and humidity. GM termed the recall unwarranted but said it would abide by the safety administration's decision. The recall would inflict a heavy blow of $1.2 billion to the automaker. Takata airbag inflators are tied to 18 deaths in the U.S., though none of those involved GM vehicles. In football, Wolverhampton Wanderers have drawn their home fixture one all against Southampton. Theo Walcott's 58th minute goal was equalised by Wolves' Pedro Neto 17 minutes later. Southampton are fifth in the Premier League table, while Wolves moved up three places to ninth spot. In another fixture, Burnley beat Crystal Palace 1-0 at the Turf Moor. 
Chris Wood converted Jay Rodriguez's pass to score the only goal of the match. Champions Liverpool also thrashed Leicester City 3 0 at the Anfield. Johnny Evans, Diogo Jota, and Roberto Firmino scored goals for the hosts. The fourth week of the UEFA Champions League is set to begin today. Top teams have a lock horns for the most prestigious competition in Europe. The toughest fixture of the day will feature Liege 1 champions Paris Saint-Germain coming up against German side RB Leipzig. PSG have managed only one win in their three Champions League fixtures so far, while Leipzig won two. Good news for injury hit PSG as both of their star players, Neymar and Kylian Mbappé, will be back after recovering from their injuries. Mbappé is also struggling and has not found the back of the net in the competition in his last seven outings. In another encounter, Barcelona will be up against Ukrainian side Dynamo Kyiv. Manager Ronald Koeman has rested Lionel Messi for the trip as Barcelona comfortably sit top of their group. Bundesliga side Borussia Dortmund will host Belgian side Club Bruges in a Group F encounter. Dortmund lead the group with two wins out of three matches while the Belgians only manage one. AC Milan striker Zlatan Ibrahimovic will be out of action for at least 10 days after he picked up a muscle injury during a match against Napoli. In a statement, the Serie A club said it could take between two and three weeks for Ibrahimovic to recover. The 39-year-old scored twice before suffering the injury as AC Milan recorded their first league win in Naples for over 10 years. The Swedish striker has scored 10 goals in six league games this season. The Serie A leaders have 20 points after eight league games and faced 15th placed Fiorentina on Sunday. England has decided to allow a limited number of fans to attend sports events after its lockdown ends on December the 2nd. Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced that a maximum of 4,000 fans will be allowed at outdoor events in the lowest risk areas. Up to 2,000 people will be allowed in Tier 2 areas, but none in Tier 3. Indoor venues in Tiers 1 and 2 can have a maximum of 1,000 spectators. The organized grassroots sports will be able to resume and gyms and leisure centers can reopen across all tiers. Elite sport in England has continued behind closed doors during the lockdown, but grassroots and amateur sports has been halted since 5th of November. Now the weather situation from around the globe. That's all for now. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at Indus.news.